Okay, thank you, T. Um, and thank you to the audience for your interest in the subject area. Um, so let's imagine that you're an astronaut and you're landing on the surface of Mars and you start to open that hatch. And the question is, are you walking into the abyss or do you actually know what the environment is like that you're going to be entering? And on the count of uh, many uh, missions to Mars, including the rovers, as well as um, spaceships uh, circ circumnavigating the planet, we actually know a lot about the environment on Mars. And what we can say is the, that the atmosphere really cannot support aerobic life. Uh, it's a very carbon rich atmosphere. It's 95% carbon dioxide, but it only has 1% of the Earth's pressure. And what that practically means is that water will boil at body temperature. And so if you were to walk outside without a spacesuit, you would boil immediately. Not a good idea. We also know that there's plenty of water on Mars. It's no longer visible on the surface of Mars, but deeply buried in, uh, in sediments and in the soil. Uh, we also know there are polar ice caps uh, and transient glaciers on Mars, but it's been estimated that if that water were actually liquid, it would cover the surface of Mars to a depth of 35 feet. So there's plenty of water that would be available for life. Solar radiation is, is another interesting issue. Uh, the intensity of the light from the sun on the Mars surface is about 60% of that that on the Earth, uh, actually. And that's sufficient to support photosynthesis and at rates of photosynthesis that would actually allow you to grow plants and other photosynthetic organisms. The challenge, however, is that there is no ozone layer in the atmosphere, nor magnetic field to shield the planet from ionizing radiation. And so there is a tremendous amount of ionizing radiation that could be damaging to living organisms, and that would have to be managed as well. And then fortunately, we also know a lot about the soil on account of the rover activities. Um, it's largely of basaltic origin. The mineral compositions are similar to Earth. Uh, there is the presence of perchlorate, which is an oxidant, which could be a challenge. But the mineral composition is sufficient to grow plants. If we can go to the next slide. So the next slide is, is two scenarios uh, for the Martian ecosystem. Uh, many of you may be familiar with the Martian movie. Uh, and this uh, particular scene on the left is Matt Damon growing his famous potato field uh, in his uh, Mars colony after he's been abandoned on the surface of Mars. And he realizes that he's going to have to sustain his life for at least a year uh, before he can leave the planet and, and uh, return to Earth. And so famously in this scene, he's planting potatoes um, to uh, supply his food for uh, at least a year. And if you do some quick calculations on, on how many potato plants would be necessary to sustain uh, one human for one year, it would be a field that's about 220 meters squared. And that's assuming that you would get two potato crops per year. So there's no seasons in this uh, enclosed environment. Um, if you sort of eyeball the size of this picture, what Matt has actually planted is probably about half the number of potatoes he really needs. But there's some other important elements that we need to consider for agriculture on Mars. And those are elemental uh, issues. And by elemental, I mean elements such as nitrogen. So nitrogen recycling is going to be a critical element in agriculture uh, on the planet Mars. Um, we also have to be concerned about risk. Any crop that has only two uh, production periods per year is a risky system. Uh, we have to wait three to six months for each crop to develop to the point where it can be harvested. And then finally, potatoes, maybe not the best choice. They're largely starched, low in protein, low in lipids. And if we're going to take that biomaterial and perhaps transform it, 
into other bioproducts that may be useful for sustained life on Mars. Using, starting with starch, unless it's processed through fermentation, which I believe Lahira would talk about, uh, is going to limit the number of products that can be generated from a potato cr crop. So the alternative, which is the area that I work in, is algae. And algae actually have a photosynthetic efficiency that's about five times better than crop plants. And so a much smaller surface area would be required to grow algae that would provide sufficient energy, calories, protein, and lipids uh, to support a single person. It's about five-fold smaller uh, than that would be required if you were to grow a crop plant. In addition, many algae can actually reduce nitrogen from the atmosphere into ammonia, and that can be available for protein synthesis. So that allows us to have a circular economy or circular biology uh, around uh, the conservation of elements such as nitrogen. And algae are robust. They can be harvested 24 seven. They recite, we can recycle the water and the nutrients. And very importantly, if the crop fails, it's very easy to restart. And it could be back up in a matter of days. So that reduces the risk. And then finally, the last point I'll touch on is that algae biomass is actually an ideal feedstock for hydrocarbon-based biomaterials. In many of the studies that I've been involved in, in with the Department of Energy, we've demonstrated we can produce a bio crude from algal biomass that has the same chemical properties as petroleum, which of course is a feedstock for many of the plastics and other materials that we consume on Earth. So the question is, is can it work? Can we actually live on the surface of Mars? And if we manage uh, and account for all the mass and energy and the issues around ionizing radiation, I think the answer is probably we can. But also there are very important lessons for Earth because we're facing some of the same issues on Earth. And that is we have linear agricultural systems that don't recycle nutrients, that are energy inefficient, um, and perhaps not as robust as they could be. So I think the lessons that we learned from uh, developing agricultural systems on Mars can actually have applications for the Earth. And I'll finish there, thank you.